and welcome to the Bahamas, the location for the world's strongest man competition of 1995. We begin here on New Providence Island, which is home to the Bahamian government. From the capital Nassau, it controls the 700 or so islands which make up the Bahamas. Today, 20 strong men from around the world have come together to do battle for this year's crown. Among them, the man who currently holds it, Icelander Magnus for Magnusson. He'll be defending the title he fought so hard to win in last year's nail-biting final at Sun City in South Africa. Magnus, in fact, now in the lead at the third. This is real drama. It's Magnus and the time is fast. This one is for the title. 29 seconds. Herbal Kiri and the rest are beaten. This year's challenge could prove even harder. The competition comprises one extra heat, which means there'll be ten men in the final compared to last year's eight. With more on the first heat and who's taking part, here's Paul Dickinson. The format is simple. There are four men in each heat taking part in four different events. If you win an event, you score four points. If you come second, you score three and so on. And the two men who accumulate the greatest number of points in each heat, they progress through to the final. But qualifying is not going to be easy. Every event is a real test of strength and determination. So now let's meet the men who will get the world's strongest man, 1995, well and truly underway. Namibia's Anton Boucher, a surprise finalist last year, is the youngest man in the competition. He claims he has the strongest arms in the world. Magnus Val Magnusson, as you just saw, is the defending champion. The man that everyone fears most, he is a fantastic all-round strength athlete. Weighing in at an incredible 400 pounds, Joe Onosai from Western Samoa is a tribal prince who's got a fierce competitive streak. To complete the lineup, Baron Venenberg is the Netherlands' strongest man and certainly one of the most muscular we've ever seen in this contest. At the eastern entrance to the island's harbour stands the ancient Fort Montague, and it's here that the crowds are gathering for the start of the contest. The first event is called the Car Walk. This car, complete with its engine, weighs around 380 kilograms, which is about 58 stone. The idea is to put the car onto your shoulders using these straps and carry it as quickly as you can down the course. Now, just getting the thing off the ground seems pretty impossible, but in fact, the hardest part for the strongmen is actually controlling the vehicle once it's moving. As if the 25-meter course weren't enough, the competitors must also conquer their nerves. It doesn't matter how experienced you get, you still get nervous, don't you? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just a little. <laughs> How do you feel about this year? Last year you were a first timer, this year you've got more experience. Yeah, this year uh, I'm more experienced. Uh, last year I was on my nerves, you know, and uh, I will do better than last year. It's a very tough group you're in though. I am, I am. Joe, you're bigger this year, you look very much fitter than last year. You must feel well. Yeah, I was 350 pounds last year and 400 pounds this year, um, but I'm, I'm a lot better fit. Uh, I feel great. By contrast, Baron Vandenberg too busy preparing for this first event to tell us exactly how he feels. Or perhaps he's feeling a little bit nervous because in Orange two years ago, he tried this event, he didn't like it, he never managed to leave the starting line. So the final preparations for an event which is really going to test our strong men to the limit. Well, as Juliet said, getting the car off the ground is hard enough. Remember, there's still an engine inside that car. He's setting his own rhythm, and the crowd really beginning to get behind him. Just look at the way those straps are cutting into his shoulders. He's just past the 10-meter mark. He's taking very, very small steps indeed. This is beginning to look like a real struggle for Venenberg. It looks absolutely agonizing. He's now got about five meters to go. He can pick it up and start again. The time limit is 90 seconds. It looks as though he's going to have difficulty getting moving again. He just gets a little dive forward to get the extra yard or so. A measurement will have to be taken if he can't complete the course. And that is Venenberg's first event finished. The gauntlet has been thrown down. Varen being helped by the team doctors, I think just as a precautionary measure. Anton Boucher, the youngster, up next. Looking a little nervous, 
wearing that very thick blue elasticated super suit for extra Ready. support. Left. Well, the word is given by referee Dr. Douglas Edmonds, and so Anton's campaign getting underway. He doesn't look particularly comfortable, but he's really beginning to move now. Doesn't seem as though he fills the car up as much as the Dutchman. He's going very, very well. Just needs to keep the steering right. That is a fantastic time, 25.2 seconds. So for the time being, he's in the lead. Now, there's a bit of tension in the audience as we wait for the really big man. Joe on a side, who might look as though he'd have trouble getting into the car. He looks absolutely massive. Just using that door frame to leave his belt even tighter. The crowd really looking forward to this one. Too balanced, does it? But look, that's the time in the left-hand corner of the screen that he has to beat. 25.2 by Boucher. He's really striding out here. Those massive legs are really moving well. This is incredible, as long as he keeps going straight. He's absolutely blown Anton's time away. 21.15 seconds. A very impressive start indeed, and he's enjoyed it. The car looks so tiny next to him. The crowd have really seen something special here. Anton knows it too. And we've got another great competitor who's the next to go. Magnus Ver Magnussen has won this event in World's Strongest Man before, so he knows exactly what he's capable of. But that time of Joe's was stunning. Well, the marshal's just checking, making sure the driver is comfortable. Just like the start of a Formula One race, but you won't see him burning up the track when the whistle is blown. Ready! Well, he gets the rhythm going just like Venneberg did. Balance is so important here. Once you've lost it, it's very difficult to recover. That's on a size time on the left. That's what he's got to try and beat. It's going to be very, very close. It's just outside, 21.73 seconds. So the world champion, despite looking happy, he finishes second. A good effort by Magnus for Magnussen, but Joe Onasai picked him at the post to go into first place. Did you really think you could win that one? Uh, actually, I, I would have been happy with second, you know, because I know Magnus is a very good car walker. But, uh, you know, I'm very excited. I'm very excited that... Uh, I've got first, and uh, it's just a good start. It's not a bad start for the reigning champion. It's okay. It's uh, a good start for... We've still got three events to do. So uh, if I just qualify for the finals, it's okay. You're still a little bit nervous? Uh, no, I'm getting okay now. I'm getting cool. <laughs> Tourism is the Bahamas' number one industry, and Nassau is a popular destination for cruise liners. The islands were governed by Britain until 1973, and the centre of Nassau retains much of its colonial architecture. It's the old town that provides the backdrop for the next event, the log lift. Among the assembled spectators, a strong contingent from the Netherlands, here to support Dutchman Berend Venneberg. Berend, how about this event for you? First time, uh, last time is not the best. I have to make it uh, really good today to do this event. This event that but I almost have to do it, and can do maybe. Well, just in case he's in any doubt, that's the way to do it, and doesn't it look easy? It's going to be different for Anton and Berend, though, in a few moments, when this Bahamian audience are going to see them try to muscle up the 17-stone log as many times as they can. Anton Batcher on the left, I just wonder how strong those arms are. And Berend Venneberg, the muscle man. Ready? The scores will be shown at the top of the screen, and Vanneberg has started very quickly indeed. Badger already going behind. You can see both men's scores, and they're rising very quickly indeed. Tremendous definition Vanneberg has. Anton taking things a little bit steadier. That may be a tactic. In fact, he's beginning to catch Berend up now, and this is where the arms and shoulders really begin to hurt. The Dutchman, in fact, is beginning to fade. 
they're level now and there he goes on to 20 Venneberg beginning to struggle on 19 it looks as though Namibia is going to win this pairing Anton wins it he's on 21 that was almost a case of the tortoise and the hare a splendid effort by both men but Venneberg looking very disappointed and Boucher querying his score with the judges for a 19 scored were you happy with that no, it's not enough. I need to have like the same as in the training, about 20, 20, 21. Did the referee count every one of yours, or did he cut you down on the number? No, yeah, he, uh, they've got officials on each side, and they count it. If you didn't lock your arms out, there's no lift. You've got two very strong competitors to come, Monosa and Magnuson. Very Is that going to be enough? 21, I don't know. I don't think so. Anton's total is formidable, but with Magnus and Joe getting strapped in here, are we going to see his score eclipsed? Ready, set, <whistles> go, go. A referee Edmund shouting something to Onasai there. The huge Samoan having trouble getting the log all the way down to his chest. But both men's scores ticking away, and it's Magnuson with the slight advantage at this stage. Joe just pushing away, making it all look so easy. Magnus just with a little bit more body movement, approaching 20 now. He's trying so hard to move ahead of Anton. Joe's still going, he's catching up the Icelander in fact, and going for the win. What a fantastic effort. It's 22 all, and look at this, he's got the 23. Magnuson is second once again. Onasai really has got off to a fantastic start this year. The top two putting on a great display for everybody. Interestingly, all four finished in the same order as event one, with the defending champion still chasing Joe Onasai. Anton had done uh, 21, so I had to go for 22 to get, to get him. And, uh, but I couldn't watch, watch Joe at the same time. So the reigning champion still in that crucial second position, but the perfect start for the South Pacific Islander with two events to go. Two wins out of two, that's a big difference to last year. Oh, you know, like I said, I'm usually a slow starter. Two first places, I'm happy, I'm You're very not excited. A, not a slow starter anymore? Not a slow starter anymore. Well done. Thank you. Now, isn't this a lovely sight? The islands of the Bahamas really are white sand and turquoise sea. For this next event, we've left the colonial splendor of Nassau to come here to neighboring Paradise Island. It's a five and a half mile stretch of land which is linked to Nassau by a bridge. The island's primarily a holiday resort packed with hotels. Its beaches are a haven for sun seekers, the sea a welcome respite from the intense heat. Prior to the start of the competition, Paul caught up with the reigning champion, Magnus for Magnuson, to find out more about the man whose title the other competitors are desperate to claim. Uh, after Sun City last year, I, uh, I called my girlfriend and said, I'm not doing it again, that's it. I was, I was wrecked. But uh, after a while, you, know, you start getting hungry again. Now, you've been doing these competitions possibly longer than anybody else now. How did you get started originally? Well, I started, uh, uh, started doing powerlifting when I was about 18 years. Uh, I was always been interested in, you know, strength, and so I tried a little bit of shot putting and discus throwing and all that soccer, and I never really found that it, it was for me until I started lifting. Uh, I found out that was what I wanted to do and. I got to be a uh, European champion in powerlifting twice. Uh, last time was in 91. After I won in 91 by beating everybody by miles, uh, I got invited for the World's Strongest Man 91, uh, which I won. So that's basically it. Now, you've mentioned powerlifting, and there is also Olympic lifting as well, the sort of thing you'd find in Olympic Games. But this sort of competition, it's not just a question of that sort of strength, is it? Uh, no, uh, I've changed my, uh, my training a lot since being a powerlifter. I still do like basic powerlifting things, 
but I also do some bodybuilding work. I also do uh, Olympic lifting work, and I also do some track and field work. So you have to combine these things, find out what works for you, and just try them out. Well, I'm not exactly sure what works for Paul, but it's definitely not this. What's that? No, stop it. You have to go deeper down. Yeah? Yeah. I'll never get up, but it's... Uh, that's why you should just light the weights. You're supposed to give me some encouragement. <laughs> it looks pretty painful sometimes, but do you still enjoy it? Uh, when I think back, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And he should enjoy this next event. It's the deadlift. There's a car together with four rather nervous-looking passengers, and our strong men have to lift it and hang on to it for dear life for as long as possible. The competitors going in reverse order from the placings in the last event. Baron being urged on by the crowd and his girlfriend, Sylvia. He really needs to produce something incredible here if he wants to go through to the final. He's going to be helped here to strap himself onto the car by Jamie Reeves, who won the World's Strongest Man back in 1989. He's now one of the organizers here in the Bahamas. So, let's see what Venenberg can do. The clock will start when the referee blows his whistle after the initial lift. He'd be a very handy guy to have around in an emergency, wouldn't he? Just look at those straps cutting into the hands. Well, this test is not just about strength, but guts and determination as well. The clock ticking away over 40 seconds. And this is beginning to look like his best event so far. Certainly not to be recommended if you haven't trained for this sort of event. He's fast approaching the 60-second barrier. This is absolutely fantastic. Just what he and the crowd wanted. An unbelievable effort, but just look at him now. That should make him very happy indeed. When you passed 60 seconds, the rest of the competitors went very, very quiet. They knew you'd done a great time. I hope she was a great time. I hope she was a winning time. I need it, and tomorrow too. Thank you. But I just wonder how long it will take him to recover from that effort. But it's all eyes now on Anton Boucher, who, like Berend, needs a much better performance here. Ready. Look. <laughs> the weight of 1,200 pounds being lifted very easily. That shows you just how strong these men are. There's the target in the left-hand corner. Boucher has gone over 30 seconds. Vanneberg watching intently, approaching 40 seconds now with total concentration. This is a very good effort from Anton Boucher. He's looking comfortable, but he's gone. That is a surprise. Anton looking subdued, and I don't think he can go through to the final. You have to wait and see how the other guys do. But uh, next year, still a chance. I'm still young, I'm 20 years old. The other guys are 10, 15 years older than me, so uh, I think there is a future for me. <laughs> it does seem as though he's resigned to an early exit this year, unlike this man, for whom anything less than victory would be a huge personal failure. He's a former European powerlifting champion, so he should be well suited to this event. A final check on the grip, helped by Jamie Reeves, who actually beat a fellow countryman of Magnussen when he won the title in 1989, and that was Jean-Paul Sigmerson. 550 kilograms the weight there for Magnus van Magnussen, the reigning champion. He's just over 30 seconds, but Venneberg's time looking better and better all the time. Getting very close to 40 seconds now. He's trying to challenge Anton's 44.3 seconds. He goes past, but he's down. That is a surprise. He's beaten Anton, but with Joe coming up next, I thought he might have challenged for the lead. Magnus, I know that was difficult, but there's a little smile there which suggests you knew exactly what you were doing. Is that right? Yeah, because uh, Berend beat Anton, and Berend is lowest in point. So that means it gets some more gap if I just get ahead of Anton. So, I'm playing tactics here. Yeah? <laughs>
Well, I hope he hasn't made an error of judgment. If Joanna Sai can beat him, Magnus will finish down in third place, and that means it's down to the wire in the last Three. event. So what sort of magic can Joe Onasai produce? He looks very cool indeed, doesn't he? Solid as a rock is Joe Onasai, who's really hit a purple patch during this heat. 30 seconds now, and still looking comfortable. I wonder how those passengers are getting on. Approaching 40 seconds, he's now going to chase the time set by Anton and Magnus. He's actually enjoying it. He goes past Anton, he goes past Magnus. Now he's off to Vandenberg. Oh, not quite, but it's good enough for second. After coming fourth in the last two events, Baron Vandenberg gets the win he so desperately needs. Joe slips into second. That's a big difference to last year. You were a surprise finalist. You're dominating this heat now. You must be delighted. Oh, very delighted. I mean, we're the only heat that we have four veterans in there, and including the world champion. So I'm just excited, very excited. He can afford a smile, but what about Magnus being chased by Berend into the last event? These are what are known as the McGlashan Stones. The tradition of lifting rocks as a test of strength dates back hundreds of years. In the past, young boys used to have to lift a stone like this onto a wall at waist height to prove they were men. Now, in past competitions, the strong men have been required to lift five of these onto barrels. Today, though, they have to tackle eight, ranging in weight from 100 kilograms to 135, which is about 21 stone. And incidentally, nobody has ever managed to complete all eight stones. So what price, Anton Boucher, going out in a blaze of glory? <whistles> Anton is away. Up it goes, no problem there. He literally threw it up on top of the barrel. A little bit more effort required with that one, but he's going well. I just wonder if his height is going to be a disadvantage for this competition. That's number four. Jim Pollock there, one of the marshals, just making sure the barrel is stable. Now then, on to number six and still going well. I bet the soft sand here is creating very, very tough conditions indeed for these men. Come on now, Anton. Oh, now this one weighs 270 pounds. He's lost it. He's looking very tired now. I think he's had enough. That was a very good effort indeed. Six barrels achieved. That's the target for everybody else. And meanwhile, they're watching and waiting. Magnus, this event is vital, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I need to get at least second in this one to be able to go to the finals. Can you do it? It's you against Feneberg, really, isn't it? Yeah, that's my name this time. The Icelandic flag in the foreground there will be waved furiously in a moment by Magnus's girlfriend, Austa. Magnus, though, perhaps now realising that his tactics in the deadlift were not so good after all. <whistles> However, this is a similar event to the dramatic finale in Sun City last year, where this man just beat Austrian Manfred Herbel to take the title. So he certainly knows the technique and he's got the strength, but how far and how fast can he go? That's number four and this is looking good. Number five with a bit of a struggle. The crowd going absolutely crazy for Magnus, especially Alster, who can be heard above all the rest. Now number seven. This one weighs 120 kilos, and this is where Anton finished his challenge. The last one coming up. All 20 stones of it, 280 pounds. Can he do it? Can he become the first man to get the eight stones? He does. Fantastic, and he might well celebrate. I think Venneberg knows his chance is gone. Magnus, I guess the sign of a true champion is to do it when it really matters, and you did exactly that. Nobody's ever done that before, eight stones. Uh, it, was, it was pretty hard, actually, and I had to go fast. Uh, I knew I was through anyway by giving, getting the... Just a six, because I knew it was faster than Anton. But uh, I wanted to do them all. <laughs> and he did them in style. Now, 
I wonder how Joe feels about this event. He really doesn't have to break sweat here. Last place and one point is good enough to take him through to the final. So what is he going to do? The first one's wobbling about a bit, but it's there. And that's your answer. He just walks away and who can blame him? He's in the final. Berendt is the last to go, but with mixed feelings, I'm sure. This one really is for personal pride, but without the glory. He had to win this event with Magnus back in third place to qualify, but with the Icelander guaranteed at least second, Berendt's competition is effectively over. But he's going well here. Sylvia giving her support. Berend is really putting up a fantastic effort here. He's so, so strong. He's full of guts and determination. Now, can he do number six? That's the answer. Magnus's time still within his sights. Come on now, Baron. Let's finish this in style. That's number seven. Just one more to go. He's just got five seconds to lift the last stone. 130 kilos. He's going to miss the time. But what a performance! So the Magnussen wins and gets a world record in the process. A great try by Venneberg, but not quite enough. Brand a magnificent performance. Only the second man to have ever lifted all eight stones. Magnus, of course, the first. But you must be disappointed a little bit. I was disappointed. I give all that I have. I'm making this appointment with the car walk. I can't do anything about it now. There was blood, sweat and perhaps even a few tears. But there it is, Magnus and Joe are our first qualifiers for the final. How do you feel about the final now? You've cruised through, really. You've uh, produced some tremendous performances. Are you confident? I'm very confident. I think the finals have a lot of uh, events that is that are advantageous to the big event, so I'm really, I'm really excited and looking forward to it. So, after that gruelling contest, we have our first two finalists. The defending champion, Magnus for Magnussen from Iceland, and the huge Samoan, Joe Onasai. But there are still four heats to go and eight other strongmen to qualify. Competitors in Heat 2 include the Briton Gary Taylor. Now, Gary won the competition in 1993, but last year he got knocked out in the qualifying heats. Is he back on form? Next week is Children in Need, so we'll be back in two weeks' time. I do hope you'll join us then. Goodbye. And a warm welcome to New Providence Island in the Bahamas, where the stage is set for Heat 2 in the search to find the world's strongest man of 1995. New Providence is home to the Bahamian capital, Nassau, and to more than half of the total population of the islands. 
Now, in the last programme, we saw the defending champion Magnus for Magnusson from Iceland and the Samoan Joe Onasai both qualify for the final. Among those trying to join them today is Welshman Gary Taylor. Now, Gary won the competition two years ago, but was unexpectedly knocked out in last year's qualifying heats. This time around, he says he's determined to succeed. time of anybody. Well, with more on the challenges that he and the other competitors face here today, here's Paul Dickinson. As we saw in the first heat, qualifying can be very difficult, but our format is simple. There are four men in each heat taking part in four different events. If you win an event, you score four points, three for second, and so on. And the two men who accumulate the greatest number of points, they progress through to the final. Well, as Juliet just said, it was Gary Taylor who created the biggest shock last year, making tactical errors rather than lacking in strength. I just hope he doesn't make the same mistakes again. So now let's meet Gary and the rest, our competitors, in Heat 2. Stasis Messias is a champion weightlifter from Lithuania, a country which idolizes its strongmen, but he's got little experience in this type of contest. Wayne Price is one of the biggest men in this year's competition, 23 stones of solid muscle, which could make him a real contender for a place in the final. Bernard Roll is a totally unknown quantity, but one thing is for sure, the support he will get in the Bahamas will be fanatical. Finally, Gary Taylor knows his reputation is on the line, but he's back to his best, having set a number of world record lifts in 1995. The contest begins at Montague Bay on the eastern end of the island and hundreds of spectators have flocked here for the start. The first event has a distinctly nautical theme, which I suppose isn't that surprising seeing as we're on an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's called the anchor pull. Now, while most of us use an anchor to secure a boat, the strongmen have to carry this one down the course, weighing around 16 stone, that's 100 kilograms, and then drag this white anchor back up again, and it weighs 35 stone. The 25-metre course is likely to prove hard, even for the most experienced competitors. Gary, yeah, just looking a little bit pensive. Well, as it's been proved in the last competitions over the last few years, I'm a notorious slow starter, so... Obviously, I'm thinking quite a lot about this one. Um, it's the anchor drag. Uh, quite difficult. We've got to run 50 metres carrying these things. Um, unknown quantity. But two competitors in the group we don't really know anything about, so I'm trying to get my mind psyched up, ready for it. I'm just optimist. I'm so optimistic. My group is very good. I'm very stiprous. I'm very good. 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 I think you've got a tough group today. Yeah, and it's a tough event today, especially after seeing the anchor today. It's, um, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a real tough event. You've got a former world champion in your group, in the qualifying group, Gary Taylor. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and give Gary Taylor a run, a run also, you know, and maybe may the best man win. And you've got lots of support here. I have a lot of support. All my fans are here and a lot of people from here in Nassau. And I'm very feel happy to see everybody out here right now today, you know. And it's, I feel happy, very confident. There's a real carnival atmosphere here, mainly thanks to Bernard, who's the first competitor to try and negotiate the 25-metre course. I hope his supporters won't be disappointed. This is going to be very tough indeed. Well, that part looked easy, and so the second heat gets underway. Bernard, one of two brand new faces in World's Strongest Man competition this week. Stasis Messias, he's the other, and he will go next. Well, Bernard already having a slight problem, but if you think this anchor looks hard to move, just wait until the next one gets underway. There must be easier ways of making a living. Almost at the end of the first leg of the journey, and he just strolls over to the start of the next one. Now this is a truly massive weight to shift, 230 kilograms. That's about the weight of two Frank Brunos he's trying to drag along the ground. I can't imagine any of our strong men are looking forward to this event. The grip on the iron loop looks as though it's going to be one of the most difficult parts of this event to master. But I tell you what, Fort Montague hasn't heard as loud a cheer in many years. The crowd are going absolutely berserk. Roll there, he's wearing a gum shield so he doesn't bite into his own tongue when he's making his effort. So that's a new innovation in World's Strongest Man. If he does come to a complete stop, a measurement will have to be taken and that will be the target for the rest. 
His heart will be racing at about 180 beats per minute now, and this looks as though it's the end. Referee Doug Edmonds in the yellow shirt, he will mark the spot. Stasis Messias must have mixed feelings having watched Roll's efforts. As he said in his interview, he will need a little luck to come through this competition in style. Looking very nervous at the start. Ready. Off we go. And look at this, a brilliant start, just demonstrating the sort of explosive power he's got as an Olympic weightlifter. Tremendous determination by the Lithuanian. Almost throwing that one down there in contempt, but how is he going to handle this beast? Well, weightlifters are renowned as having very strong grips, so that shouldn't be a problem, but his relatively light body weight of just 120 kilos, that might be his downfall. He's still behind roll at the moment, so he needs a few more meters yet. It's a long, long way to the finish. And there's Roll's marker just behind. He's got about three meters to go to catch him, but he's had enough. That was a real baptism of fire for Messias, and it was very hard indeed. There's the measurement taken. And now Wayne Price strides out looking as if he really means business. He competed in his first World's Strongest Man in Sun City last year, but he didn't make it through to the final. He gets away, but he's not looking all that smooth. Oh, a little readjustment already. Messius was away like a rocket compared to Price's first run. Those are the markers he's got to beat on the way back. Throws it down. Now, how can he handle this one? He's got absolutely massive muscular development in his upper body. And already this is beginning to look good. He's tremendously strong. Huge biceps, probably bigger than most people's legs. He's gone past Messius. Now he goes past Roll. Takes a little rest, so good points already for Price, with only Gary Taylor to come. Well, when it comes to an endurance event like this one, our strong men's muscles really start to burn after this sort of effort. Just losing the grip a little bit there. Now, are the crowd going to see the first man to complete the course? The cheers seem to be even louder than they were for Bernard Roll. He's just got about a metre to go. Wayne Price does it just inside a minute and a half, and that is going to be very tough to beat. I don't think he wants to see that anchor again in a hurry. Gary looking very nervous as we get ready for the world's strongest man from 1993. And the first event last year was where it all went wrong for the Welshman. Gary Taylor is one of the most dynamic strongmen I've ever seen with so much experience, but I wonder if he can conquer his nerves today. So far, so good. Throws it down, just like Wayne Price did. And straight on with the next one. Well, that's Wayne's time in the top left-hand corner of the screen. That's the one that Gary will be aiming for. Taking short, sharp steps to get into a rhythm, which is going to take him straight past Messius and Roll. So he's got three points in the bag already. Go, go, go. That's coach Mark Harris giving encouragement. And already it's beginning to look a little slower than Wayne Price's time. So when that clock goes past 1 minute 27 seconds, it really won't be worth making any more agonizing effort because he's in second place already. But Gary is still going for it in a big way. It's so difficult to grab hold of this anchor. But Gary really putting on a big show here. He needs to get the tip of the anchor just over the line. He's done it. He looks absolutely shattered. What a fantastic effort. Well, that exhausting event puts Gary Taylor into second place behind South Africa's Wayne Price. The Lithuanian Stasis Messias is fourth. Many congratulations, Wayne. That's four points under the belt. You must be delighted. I am really. Like I said, 
carried also a very strong puller in this event, but it's a tough object to pull, so it was just in my favour today. It was a good spirit there in the competition. I saw, saw you shouting for Gary. Well, seeing I've just done it, and I know what he's going through, and I know how much it helps if you just hear a little encouragement from the, from the side. Back on the Masses table, Gary had time to reflect on the event and the pain. You couldn't train for that kind of burn, you know, that feeling. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. Nassau is an old colonial town where the Surrey still proves a popular way of getting around and seeing the sights. The heart of the capital is the location for event two, the Hercules Hold. With arms outstretched, the strong men have to support these barrels for as long as they can. Well, despite the disappointment of finishing with only one point in the first event, Stasis Messius might just fancy his chances here. Weightlifters always have strong grips, so this might be a good one for him. Ready? This is almost as much a battle of willpower as strength, and not an event that Gary Taylor is looking forward to very much because of a history of hand injuries. Messius already finding this one difficult. Those barrels weigh as much as a fridge freezer with all your Christmas shopping in it. Well, the grip looks as though it's on its way out. 23.87 seconds, and somehow, I don't think that's going to be enough. Well, now the crowd are going to get very noisy indeed. Bernard Roll walks in, the strongest man for many years in these parts. Calls himself Spinks after one of his heroes, the former heavyweight champion of the world. Those two giant barrels on each arm and a great big barrel chest approaching 60 inches in circumference. He's going to go past the Lithuanian's time and he looks in perfect control, almost relaxed. Now that is going to send Nassau wild. Are we going to build up to another one? <laughs> this is a fantastic effort. If you can imagine your arms about to be pulled out of their sockets, that's what these guys are going through. 46.55. For the time being, Bernard is a star. Your time is just over 46 seconds, so uh, did you expect that much? No, I didn't expect that, but the crowd pushed me on and made that possible. Well, Gary has performed in front of crowds at Olympic Games and World Championships and many strength contests, but I'm not sure he or his family there would have ever heard anything like that last cheer for Bernard Roll. Now, how much did that last event take out of him? And can the old injuries, not only his hand, but both biceps as well, hold out in the face of a tough target to beat? There's Mamroz in the left-hand corner, hoping that Sun has got things under control. He's going to go past Stasis's time. Oh, now the left hand may have given out a bit there, and all of a sudden it looks like agony. 31.76, but Gary and his supporters looking concerned. Was there a problem? I really worked hard on my grip over this year, and the last time I did that, I managed 53 seconds. But yesterday with the anchor pull, I pulled a little bit on the finger. I know it sounds like excuses, but unfortunately that's another you know, problem. I just left, right hand was fine, but left hand went, just bump. I could do to stop it. Well, I hate to say it, but Gary's disappointment may turn into a bonus for Wayne Price. If Wayne can pick up big points in this event, he would emerge as an early favourite to go through to the final. Just look at the size of his shoulders and arms. This is a strange event in some ways. Certainly Wayne capable of lifting huge weights in the gym. But the strength required here seems so specific to that grip and the shoulder joints and a lot of determination. He's getting close, he's gone past Stasis. Now getting close and shooting for Gary Taylor's time. And he's short of it, just short. So the bonus actually belongs to Gary Taylor and Roll can hardly believe he's won. I thought, I thought the 31 was there. I thought I just had him. But uh, oh, the end just went, you couldn't, I couldn't hang in there anymore. So Wayne gets third, Gary Taylor a respectable second place, but a win for local hero Bernard Roll. Bernard, well done. What's it like to feel a winner? It feels pretty good, but I'm, I'm in shock right now because I never do nothing like this yet, and it's 
it's amazing to it just go down, beat all the world champion, you know I and those guys, and these guys are good, and it's, you know, I feel very good, you know, and I am happy all the crowd who support me, and I feel great. I bet he does, especially as it means he's tied with Gary Taylor and Wayne Price for first place at the halfway stage. Well, from all the excitement in the heart of the Bahamian capital, Nassau, we've come to a more tranquil location for event three. We're now on Paradise Island, which is linked to Nassau by a bridge. It's primarily a holiday resort, packed with hotels and keen sun seekers. Many head for the Atlantis Resort, one of the largest island complexes in the world. Here there's plenty of scope for relaxing, which is just what Gary Taylor was doing when Paul caught up with him before the competition began. You're one of the most experienced men in the world at these sort of events now. Tell us briefly how you got started in these sort of uh, competitions. It goes back a long, long way. I started actually um, weightlifting uh, when I was 18 years of age, way back in uh, 1980, dare I say. And um, it's all started from there. I've done Olympic lifting, Olympic standard, bodybuilding, powerlifting, and I started strongman 1989. He really is a good snatch lifter. He's got to do well here. Get up. We're on the way. Just becoming world's strongest man, the best thing you've ever done in sport? I think achieving at any level is good, but actually becoming a world champion, obviously, you have to reign supreme above anything else. And uh, it was one hell of a feeling, yes. There's some very serious moments, aren't there, in the competition itself, but generally, I think you guys get on very well indeed, don't you? I think that's been one of the, the better things of this sport as uh, people have seen on television over the years, is the friendship and the comradeship of all the competitors. And um, even if we don't do really, really well, you know, we, we never fall out over it, we always get on well. I'll tell you what, though, the competitive streak goes everywhere with these guys. Much to the disgust of the shark, of course. But as we head back home, so will our reluctant visitor. All right, here we go. Not surprisingly, all water sports are big business in the Bahamas. Not as strenuous, though, as the next event awaiting the strongmen. Fun aside, the battle recommences, and event three is called the log lift. There's still everything to play for, and nerves are running high. Are you feeling confident? I'd like to say yes, but I, I, I just, I don't know, I'm not feeling confident myself. I need, I need a good one today to get my, boost my confidence back up, you know what I mean? Um, the last two days haven't been good for me, mentally, so I'm a bit lackadaisical. I need to get that pressure back off my shoulders and start enjoying it again. Um, it's a difference. I'm under I'm constant pressure, remember, from last year, where I got kicked out um, in the qualification. That's in the back of my mind all the time. I'm fighting nerves at the moment, believe me. I don't think he'll be the only one. As they watch the log being set up by Jim and Billy and Jamie Reeve in the centre, Stasis Messias really striding out onto the platform with the weight set at 130 kilos. That's 20 stones. Now, although this man has hoisted over 500 pounds above his head in Olympic weightlifting, this is going to be very different. Up to his chest first, but he's way off balance, and that looks nasty. My goodness, I hope he's all right. Being attended to by Jim, but he seems very dazed. Doug Edmonds, the referee, confirming he's out of the contest, so in comes Wayne Price, who should know the technique for this one quite well. That belt essential to protect the lower back. Now, I wonder if there is a problem in the log being perfectly balanced. It certainly caught Stasis by surprise. Price up a little more conservatively, up to his knees first, then to the chest. That was a big effort. He got it. Well, Gary, also an experienced man in weightlifting. In fact, an Olympic silver medalist in the lift you saw, the snatch. This log lift is more like a clean and jerk, which is the other weightlifting discipline in Olympic competition. Almost rolls it up to his chest. Very confident indeed. A good start for Gary in an event which should be his best of the three so far and being appreciated by the crowd. The news for Bernard, though, is not so good after winning that last event. It turns out he's strained a bicep muscle, so I wonder how it's going to affect him here. Trying the same technique as Gary, but not looking as good for Bernard. 
Oh my goodness, he's out of the contest and there's almost a stunned silence from his supporters. Sympathetic applause and the bar rising by 10 kilograms, but Bernard will have to sit and watch and he's having some major strapping to his arm. Gary giving Wayne a few last minute tips. These two have been training together quite a lot this year and Wayne has certainly benefited from Gary's expertise. The weight, 140 kilograms, just over 300 pounds. He didn't quite get to grips with the technique on the first lift. Heaves it up to his chest. Now he must settle himself for the final effort. He's got to get on balance. He gets it up, but I'm not sure he locked out his right arm. I think that's going to count as a failure. Uh, he confirms that with a shake of the head and a few signals to the referee that he doesn't think the log is balanced. The log is very lopsided to the right hand side. I actually got it locked, but my feet went in the right placing because I was countering for the way balance of the log. So, uh, I mean, I got my three points and I'm not going to push myself and maybe get an injury. So you're not going again? No. So that leaves Gary, who has had the weight increase to 145 kilos, and if successful, it means his first win this year. Oh, that's very impressive. Who is the strongest of them all, he says, and who are they to argue? So, Welshman Gary Taylor gets the win he so desperately wanted. Wayne is second, and Stasis is still struggling in fourth place. It's a heavy start to warm up with 135 kilos or whatever it was, with a lot, and it showed with Bernard Rowe tearing his vice up. Um, only for this, the two lads went out the two roll and thing. It was just a matter of me and Wayne messing around, and I had a bit of fun, really. Um, I got my first win, as you say. Um, good to be back on top again. The log lift made a big difference to the overall position. Taylor and Price now emerging as probable finalists with one event to go. Down on the beach here, the competitors are preparing for the next event. It's called the boat loading race. What they have to do is run over there, pick up each of those five sandbags, which weigh around 90 kilograms, rush back through the water and put them down on the platform here. Whoever does it in the fastest possible time wins. Despite being so far behind, Stasis Messias is determined to give this event all he's got. Do you think you've got a tough job ahead of you? No. This is not a tough job for me. I'm going out and I'm going to do it and do it with speed. Because this is the event now for either stay or go home and I don't want to go home. Well, home for Bernard is not far from here. So if he doesn't want to make the short car journey just yet, he will have to produce something really special. He needs to beat Wayne Price by at least two places to keep the South African out of the final. So Stasis has a role to play here as well. I'm sure Gary Taylor won't make life difficult for Wayne, so really it's all down to these two men. This is really another strength and endurance event, similar to the anchor pool. So all the odds seem to be stacked against these two men. I think they've been a bit shell-shocked at times in their first World's Strongest Man competition, but I'm sure that when the muscles have stopped aching, they will reflect and say it was all a fantastic experience. Well, Stasis seems to have got his second win here, and if he carries on like this, this is very bad news indeed for Roll. The Lithuanian has made quite a few friends here with his rugged attitude to competing with the world's best, but Roll... Well, I'm not sure he's going to get a second win. He looks absolutely exhausted. 14 stones of soggy sand in a sack would normally be small fry for these men. But after the rigors of the other events and their efforts here, it must feel like a ton. So Stasis coming in for his last. Bernard needing two more. But I think Bernard may have given it up as a bad job as Stasis plows through the water to beat Roll. A magnificent effort, 129.69. And Bernard must know his chance of being a finalist is gone. So I'm sure these two will have worked out that they don't have to compete with Stasis Messius's time. Economy of effort is what's needed here. As long as Wayne Price completes four sacks, he beats Roll and goes through to the final with Gary, who qualifies even if he comes last in this event. 
So a bit of an anticlimax to the outcome of this heat, but worth reflecting on two men in the final who've got a real chance of taking the major honours, given a little bit of luck. Well, the crowd here are still enthusiastic about this last event, and for these two, a gentle stroll in the afternoon. Having said that, who would want to go for a walk with a 14 and a half stone man on your back? And Gary there, just looking over to Wayne, even suggesting they might slow down a little. Gary, great friends with Wayne Price, who plans on opening a gymnasium sometime this year in his hometown near to the South African capital, Pretoria. He's very definitely under team orders from his more illustrious partner. If you saw these two wandering around Wandsworth High Street after a training session, you'd be amazed at just how big they are. Together, they're almost as heavy as the three men in the front row of the England rugby team. So this should be the last sack, which will mean victory in this event for Lithuania, but a guaranteed place in the final for Wales and South Africa, and the teamwork has really paid off. At last, Lithuanian Stasis Messias gets the win he's battled so hard to achieve. But it was all too much for Bernard Roll, who comes fourth. In contrast to last year, Gary and Wayne delighted to be through. Bernard and Stasis putting up a good show, each winning an event. Congratulations, fellas. You're both through to the final. Gary, I assume there was a lot of uh, talking before you actually went out there to, to see exactly what had to be done. Yes, once again, uh, I could thank the draw for that. I wanted to beat was Bernard Roll, and obviously when Messi just beat him, I meant I was through. Took a lot of pressure off me. Um, we then talked, and I just kept along with Wayne. I needed to do four sacks, a bit of company. What's that? I'm knackered now. <laughs> uh, but that was harder than it looked. It really walking in water is not easy. Wayne, well done through to the final as well, and uh, maybe a, a word of thanks and a way to Gary as well because I know he's been helping you quite a lot. Yeah, Gary has helped me quite a bit before the, before the contest and through the contest with a lot of advice and I much appreciate it. Cheers. Well, the pressure was on, but Britain's Gary Taylor and Wayne Price from South Africa now joined the defending champion Magnus for Magnuson and the Samoan Joe Onasai in the final. Before that, though, there are three more heats to go. Competitors in Heat 3 include the Briton Bill Pittock, who's making his debut in the competition, and Herrit Badenhorst from South Africa, who came fourth last year. For now, though, from the Bahamas, it's goodbye. Well, I bet even some of those fellas are scared of the dentist drill, but that could soon be a thing of the past. Tomorrow's World Report's next on BBC One. Welcome back to the Bahamas, the setting for this year's battle to find the strongest man in the world. Today's competition kicks off close to the Bahamian capital, Nassau, here on New Providence Island. Over the centuries, the islands which were governed by Britain until 1973 have been plundered by pirates, invaded by the Spanish, and today they're having to cope with an invasion of strongmen. Last week, we saw Britain's Gary Taylor qualify for the final, along with South Africa's Wayne Price. Hoping to join them today is another Briton, Bill Pittock, who's making his debut in the competition, along with Maori Colin Cox. Here with more is Paul Dickinson. We've got four brand new tests of strength for you this time, but the format remains exactly as it has been in the last couple of heats. Our four competitors taking part in four different events. 
If they win that event, they get four points. If they come second, they get three, and so on. Until eventually, the two men who accumulate the most number of points in each heat, they are the ones who progress through to the final. Well, this week's lineup is led by the vastly experienced Herrit Badenhorst of South Africa. He finished fourth in last year's final in Sun City. Let's meet Herrit and the rest, our competitors for heat three. This genial South African is always guaranteed to light up any strength contest with his wicked sense of humor and a burning desire to win. Colin Cox is a newcomer, but the Maori powerlifting champion is quietly determined to put up a good performance and qualify for the final. Heinz Olesch was knocked out of his heat last year, but the big Bavarian has grown in stature and reputation in the last 12 months. Bill Pittock from Northampton has been around the strength scene in Britain for some time, but this is his first chance at claiming international honours. Today, calm and tranquil, the Bahamas weren't always so. To try and repel possible invasions, Fort Montague was built 250 years ago, and it's here the competition kicks off. The first event in Heat 3 is called the Super Yoke. Now, this pole has two lorry engines attached to it, one on either side, and together they weigh a total of 320 kilograms, which is just over 50 stone. The idea is to lift the engines onto your shoulders and see how far you can carry them. But just imagine, it's like having a 25 stone person on each arm. Not an enviable task, especially as the course is 20 meters long. You've already seen some great competitors around. Yeah, I've competed with most of them before, so I know most of them in Europe's Strongest Man and other various competitions, so, yeah, I'm nervous. Last year, you learned a lot, so what's going to happen this year? So, this year, I hope I'm in the final. That's the important thing, and if I'm there, then I look what I, what I can do. I personally have realistic hopes. Um, I realise the experience and the, um, the magnitude of the event that I'm about to take part in, but I'm very confident in my own abilities. You had a good year last year. Can you go a couple of places better? I was fourth, uh, but I think hopefully a win this year. Well, Herrit, certainly not short on confidence. Colin Cox, though, thoughtful on his way to the first event, and the spectators perhaps disbelieving that anybody can even lift this weight, let alone walk with it. New Zealand, the first to attempt the super yoke. Well, this is going to be a slow and deliberate start, and who can blame him? The balance is going to be absolutely crucial. And as Juliet said, this is the same as a 25 stone man on each side. If you were with us in week one, imagine two giant Samoans the size of Joe Onasai on your back, and you get the picture. Well, that's Herriton and Hines getting an idea of what is to come. Oh, and Colin losing it halfway up the course and staggering around with the effort he's just made. What's the difficulty with that event? Because oh, plainly you, you had the strength to oscillates. lift the weight. It becomes a pendulum. Um, so you can't keep a stable position. Well, it can be done, but can anybody go the full distance? This is Bill Pittock, and he'll have watched that very carefully indeed. At least he's got a distance marker to aim for now. Off we go, and looking steady. Past five metres already, and striding towards Collins' marker, which he passes now. He actually seems to be picking up speed, but he must stay on course. This is a tremendous effort from Bill. 18.87 seconds. It's always difficult making your debut in World's Strongest Man, but he's done it well. I was very nervous, yeah. But um, I've done it now. <laughs> Look forward to the rest of the events now. Well, it's good that Bill is happy, but Heinz looking pensive at the start. He's much taller than Bill, five inches in fact, so he's got much further to bend to get this off the ground. And Billy and Jim there just helping a little to balance the weight. And we get away this time. The time to beat is in the left-hand corner of the screen. And look at that, he's got about a metre and a half of thick elastic bandage wrapped around each knee to give a little extra support. He's keeping on course. The pressure on the neck and the shoulders must be excruciating. Bill's time is safe, but the German has picked up speed. 21.48 seconds for Heinz Olesch. What a relief. I'm 
if it hits over. Do you think Herod can go faster than Bill? Uh, I think so. He's really strong in the legs and in the back. And if, if he can control it really quick, then maybe he can do it. Herod already enjoying the atmosphere here. And I'm sure he will have picked up on Heinz's comment about controlling the weight as early as possible. Very good news for Bill Pittock because at the end of this event, he can't finish any worse than second place. Well, without this weight, the South African would certainly be the fastest sprinter over this distance. So I just wonder what difference 320 kilograms is going to make. He's going very well indeed. He's only got about five meters to go now. That is a massive chunk off Bill Piddock's time, just over 16 seconds. And he's going to get a fantastic surprise when he sees the time. How much? Hey! So, a jubilant Herrick Badenhorst, he lies first, Britain Bill Piddock is second, but not such a happy Maori Colin Cox, who's fourth. That was a good two seconds, nearly, inside the, the leading time so far, so that was a magnificent effort. Well, I got a, I got a back power and a leg power, and uh, I think that's, that uh, showed the people. That sets you up nicely for the next few events. Is it going to give you some more confidence as well? It will, definitely, but it's still a long way. The Bahamian capital, Nassau, the architecture, a legacy of British rule. A statue of Queen Victoria presides over the next event, the Bavarian Lift. And that's the state of play so far. Just one attempt at each weight is allowed, so it's sudden death. And as Heinz passed on 270 kilograms, his next attempt here will be at 280. This event, very similar to the deadlift in powerlifting, and that orange block of concrete has to be lifted above the green line for a valid lift to take place. 280 kilos, 42 stones, and he gets it. That looked very easy for Heinz Olesch. Let's just see that again. That's what the judges are looking for there as it rises above the mark. Bill Pittock now with the same weight. All round strength required here, but especially in the legs and the lower back. Oh, this is a long, long pull for Bill. Now he's got to get those shoulders working. The second heave to get it over the line, and he's got it. Now looking forward to the emphatic winner of the first event. And that's bad news for the rest because this man is a former world record holder in the deadlift. Herod has lifted over 400 kilos in the proper competition. So this should be well within his scope. Oh, that's very smooth pulling by Herod Bardenhorst. He's got the signal already. Just seeking clarification, but it was a good lift. Herod always the showman, and I'm sure they appreciated that it looked easy. A chance for Colin Cox now to shine. Like Herod, he has a background in powerlifting, so this could be his best event. He was looking relaxed before, but then comes this incredible psyching up. Now he's got a pull, pull, pull. He's really digging into all his strength for this one. Trying for that final shrug to get the valid lift, and it's not going to come. The weight has beaten Colin, which is a pity. He was looking forward to this, just missing out on getting the weight over the marker. More weight has been added onto the Bavarian lift. It's 290 kilos now, well over 600 pounds, and Bill Pittock is the first to attempt it. And the rest of the competitors know that this man is very solid indeed in these strength events. Oh, now, is that a signal he's got a problem? They don't seem too concerned, but this might be a worry for Bill if he has felt a twinge in the shoulder. Oh, as soon as he started the pull, it looked like the problem reoccurred. So, that's the end of Bill. It's down to these two. I felt something going on my shoulder. I, went to, I put it down, went to do it again. It weren't happening, nothing's happening, so I've done something somewhere. Well, the competition has moved on at a pace. Herrit and Hines passed at 290 kilos. Then they were both successful at 300. So this is the new weight, 320 kilograms, over 700 pounds. This has got to be a big pull by Heinz Olesch. Just a little more is required. He gets it. 
That was a very good lift from the big Bavarian. And judging from this replay, he's got room to spare. Herod Badenhorst with a little last minute stretching to warm himself up and the crowd. I'm not sure Queen Victoria would have been all that amused at being shoved around there. But she's seen nothing like this before. Herod Badenhorst is rarely beaten in strongman competitions when it comes to this sort of lift, but Oles just has got the edge at the moment because he's taken fewer attempts to reach this weight. Herod must get this one to stay in with a chance of winning. It's a big, big pull. There's one little shrug, there's two. Now, come on, a big one now will get it, and he does get it. Oh, he's not very pleased. There might be a suspicion of a twinge there for Herod Badenhorst. That's the current situation. Cox and Piddick out of it. Olesh has only taken four attempts to reach 320 kilos. Herod has taken five. That might be crucial. Herod, that was a fantastic lift, but you still need to lift more to win this competition. Yeah, Hans is going to go now for the, for the world record. If he do it, I will try also to. So in actual fact, you would be happy with second place because on count back at the moment, you're, uh, you're still behind him. Is that what the situation is? Yes. You uh, actually actually gave me a very good uh, idea now. I think I was going for a 340. <laughs> but all the attention at the moment is on Heinz Olesch going for 335 kilos. This is a world record attempt. And Badenhorst knows he must go for 340. It's moving slowly, but I think this time the weight has beaten Heinz, but he still may have done enough. Can I change my... The answer is no, Herrick can't change his mind. He has to stick at 340 kilos, and that's exactly what's going to happen. Heinz, world records are never easy. That's why they're world records. You gave yeah. a good shot, though. Maybe next year. I was in good shape, but the heat takes a lot of fluid out of me, and maybe it was five kilos too much. For mere mortals, that was about 300 kilos too much. So this lift is for the win, and of course, it's a world record attempt. Heinz was right about the heat. The sweat is dripping off Herod. He can have a second go. No, it's all over. It's even too much for this great man. A long contest is finished, and Nassau has seen strength at its very best as Herod limps away. So Germany's Heinz Olisch emerges from event two as the winner. Herit Badenhorst gets second, though not without problems. He's left with a painful injury. I fell it the first time, and I, I left the, you know, the bar higher for another attempt. But I think it's, of course, it was really heavy. Uh, I don't think it was actually foolish of me to try to go for a world record in the heats. So many things left in the competition. Herit's not wrong there, because at the halfway point, in theory, it's still possible for any two of our strong men to qualify for the final. Of the 700 or so islands which make up the Bahamas, only around 20 of them are inhabited. Among them is Paradise Island, which is where we've come to for event three. It's a five and a half mile stretch of land crammed with hotels like the Atlantis Resort. It's a huge complex comprising beaches, swimming pools, and for those wanting to escape from the sun, it even houses a casino. But water sports of every sort abound. You can race around on a giant banana or just take it easy. Between events, one man doing just that was South African Herit Badenhorst. I met up with him to ask why he wanted to be a strong man. As a small boy, I was always, uh, you know, fascinated by, by big men. And, you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger was my hero. And, and uh, I always wanted to train and to, to be big and strong. Uh, not really strong, but big, you know. So, Harry, how do you get to be the size you are? Well, it's 15 years of training and training and training. Uh, very, very hard work. Uh, at this, this stage, I'm working about two to three hours a day and I'm uh, training in the gym four times a week. And um, weekends I normally go around in South Africa and doing you know, little shows and things at festivals and schools. And I love you know, the children watching you and be pulling around the things and I perform and I, I, you know, I really love it. Now, powerlifting isn't the only thing you do, is it, Herrick? I mean, you have a job. Tell us about yeah, that. I'm a salesman uh, in the photocopy business and I'm working with uh, you know, uh, 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 business people all the time, and I'm... Um, so do you wear a suit when you go to work? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine. I must you say, you know, the past, uh, the past few months, in, you know, it's, it's quite hot now in South Africa. The past few months, my uh, uh, figures don't look very well in my sales because it's, you know, it's getting hot in South Africa. And then, the, you know, most of the, of the guys don't wear ties, you know, so I can't get something to pick them up and hold them and doesn't tell it. Bye! Bye! <laughs> How do you how do you buy clothes? Is it is it really difficult to find no, clothes? I've got, like, uh, I've got someone making my clothes for me. So you can't ever buy anything off the shelf. Sometimes you know you get a size shirt that's 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 fit quite well, but but you can't just go into a shop and buy it. To put that assertion to the test, we went to try on a few clothes. This assistant was convinced he'd got just the job: a size 60 jacket. Well, so far so good, he's got it on, but perhaps not a perfect fit. Mm, lovely. Yeah. Beautiful, eh? That's my problem. Yeah. If I was Herrett, I definitely wouldn't parade this off the peg number down a catwalk. Oh, very nice, Herrett. Is this really a sport? It's hard to say, you know, lots of people ask me that, but it's, it's, it is definitely a sport, uh, a competitive sport for us but also show business. That fact is certainly not lost on Herit and the rest who love to put on a real show and this time they have to do it with another brand new event called Conan's Wheel. It's a knockout competition to see who can reach the red zone first by pushing their opponent around the capstan. Colin Cox is one of the first to go. Well, I've um, got Badenhorst first, so we're we going to have a good time. It's Maybe it's like the Springboks versus the All Blacks, New Zealand versus South Africa right from the start. Hopefully it'll be a different result. Talking about the All Blacks, this is one event which I'll bet the rugby star Jonah Lomu would be brilliant at. Weight and explosive strength is what it's all about, and it's the best of three pushes. Well, it's a former junior Springbok who's away first. Cox putting up some resistance, but it looks as though this one is going to be 1-0 to South Africa. Bardenhorst anxious to get it over and done with quickly. And Cox wondering what he must do to stem the tide. That's our next two waiting in the wings. Three, three. <whistles> Round two, and again, Herrett destroying Collins' effort. It was so quick. Cox was shaking his head. He didn't really know what hit him out there. On, Bill. Bill and Hines up next, and that picture is deceptive because the Englishman was blotting out Olesch, but the German is much, much bigger than Bill Pitter. A Northampton man, I think he's going to find this just as tough as Colin Cox did. This seems to be an event where body weight is giving a big advantage, but uh, Bill Pittick, well, I was about to say he was going well, but that was a massive effort from Olesch. First blood to Germany. Bill has to dig in now on that right-hand side. He needs a superhuman effort now. Hines with the slight advantage, but Bill Pittock is really giving this one everything he's got. Hines just digging in as well, trying to pour on the pressure. It looks as though he's going to take him again. That would be in a place in the final for Hines Olesch. And Colin Cox will face Bill for the third and fourth places. Hines, in this sort of heat, did you want to finish that contest as soon as possible? Yeah. I want to do that, okay. and I think if I win that against Herit, then I'm true in the final. That final will come after the battle for third place between two men who should be quite evenly matched. The grip is so difficult in the sand for the feet, but both men leaning on the bar. That's Kay Collins' girlfriend, and I think he probably got the message. He's going towards his first win in this event, and that is going to give him a big boost. The temperature rising all the time, and Bill contemplating what he needs to do next. Well, it's Bill who's taken the early initiative this time. That bar is looking perilously close to the throat on both men. Bill's about halfway there. He's keeping the pressure on. Oh, and Collins had enough. That is a victory for Bill after a grueling bout. But at what cost? He looks absolutely wrecked.
No sign of Bill for the third bout. But it's just been announced. Pittock concedes, so Colin will get the third place. And there's a bit of concern by the doctors for Big Bill. He's taken a real battering. Cox is on four points, Bill on six after this event. It all looks over in terms of who goes through to the final. Come on, guys! Let's Colin, though, go, still a real sportsman, giving these guys every encouragement. At worst, Herrit will be on ten points after this event, and Hines on nine, so there's no way they can be overtaken for the qualifying spots. They're not going to make it easy for each other, though. Herrit is heading towards victory. He takes it, and he's going to enjoy it. But Colin's still clapping for both of them. Bill Piddock still with the doctors, but we understand he's OK. So on to the second bout. Oh, and Herrit just storms through that one. 2-0 and maximum points. Badenhorst is in awesome form. So Herrit gets his second win in the competition. Heinz Olesch is close behind, but it wasn't easy getting there. I was a little surprised at how powerful Herrick was today. Yeah, I don't know what happens, but I think it was the start and I moved backward and backward and I think that was the problem. It was heavier than me, but I think the year I played prop forward helped me a lot. <laughs> you know that little shove? When you start off, you, did, you, you just straighten. <laughs> when you straighten, you got a guy on the back foot. That's the time you had to, had to throw in the ball. So. You don't fancy take out rugby again? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's too hard. I'm too, I'm too old and it's soft now. Believe me, he's still pretty fit and he's dominating this week's competition with Heinz Olesch, who is heading towards his first final with just one event left. Now, any motorist who's ever had a puncture and needed to use the spare tyre knows just how heavy and awkward it is to get the thing out of the boot. Well, imagine trying to handle one of these. This is a tractor tyre and the focus for the next event. The competitors have to flip it down a 15-metre course. Rolling it would be bad enough, but end over end seems a wicked test after all the bruises so far. Bill, technically, you could still get into the final at this stage, couldn't you? Uh, that'd have to be a miracle, actually, for me to get into the final. Um, one of the things is I've got a real bad injury to my tricep and lateral torn. Ooh, that so looks painful. Every time I pick something up, it hurts. So. But I'm doing my best, like I've been doing all the way through. Each one weighs 300 kilograms. That's about the equivalent of 20 ordinary car tyres. What a way to finish your first World's Strongest Man, thanks to Doug Edmonds, the referee and designer of these events. Ready? Well, that's the easy part over. Bill and Colin fighting for pride here, and perhaps even the right to be invited back next year. Well, Colin already just easing ahead on the first flip. So Bill Piddock has got a bit of work to do. Now this is the big lift here. Colin going well. Another flip for Bill Piddock. He's really worked hard during these days in World's Strongest Man. Colin Cox is going for victory. No doubt about that. Well, it looks as though Bill Piddock has had enough. Now, come on, Colin, over the finishing line. It's a good time as well. That's a great finish for this Maori, who's drawn level with Bill overall. No breakfast, it's a bit tough. <laughs> Eat a lot now, though. <laughs> and he deserves it as we get ready for the last act. Were you a little disappointed with the last performance? Yeah, I was a bit, yeah. I thought I'd do better than that, but... I can't lie, my injuries didn't bother me there, so... Just too knackered, basically, to do it. Well, last week we saw a similar situation when Wayne Price and Gary Taylor virtually just had to turn up to the last event to qualify for the final. They strolled through that event. But I must admit, Herrit Bardenhorst and Heinz Olesch really look here as though they mean business. <whistles> Colin's time to beat is 54.3 seconds. And Heinz already going well. He's making light of the fact these tyres weigh as much as both of those lorry engines we saw in the first event. He's creeping ahead of Herrit, who's had two magnificent victories so far to the German single win. That was in the Bavarian rock lift. But this last flip by Herrit was really fast, and Heinz is going to spot him drawing level just out of the corner of his eye. 
Uh, Herrett is going in for the kill. He's actually shouting at Hines to get a move on. What? I don't know where he's found the energy from. He's done it again, and now he's really milking the crowd. The time is going to be very fast. And that is one confident strongman. Baden Horst with victory number three. Hines just needing one more flip of the wheel to finish. That looks as though it's just one flip too far. Total exhaustion, but at least he can look forward to the final. A magnificent effort by Hines. He beats Bill Pittock. Maori Colin Cox is second, and another first for Herrit Badenhorst. The South African demonstrating fantastic strength this week with a near-perfect score, and Heinz Oles joins him in the final, his first in World's Strongest Man. We've almost had maximum points from all four events, so you yeah. must be feeling very confident going into I'm the fit. final. I'm fit this year. And, uh, but, I mean, you can, you, can, you can never tell in the strongman competitions. Events, it's different, and uh, anyone can still win. You're a very comfortable winner of this heat, though. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm feeling positive. Well, for his first competition, Bill Pittock certainly put up a spirited performance. He may have failed to qualify, but he certainly didn't disgrace himself. In the end, though, it was the all-round strength of Herrit Badenhorst from South Africa and Heinz Olish from Germany, which carried them through to the final. In Heat 4, Forbes Cowan from Scotland will try and make his mark alongside three other competitors. To find out what happens, join us at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye. Smaller than a sugar cube, a micro-robot in Tomorrow's World, next on BBC One. Welcome back to the Bahamas for Heat 4 of this year's competition to find the world's strongest man of 1995. Here on New Providence Island, close to the Bahamian capital, Nassau, four men are preparing to do battle for a coveted place in this year's final. Now, if you've been watching the programme, you'll know we already have six out of our ten finalists, including the Briton, Gary Taylor, and the defending champion, Magnus Vermagnuson from Iceland. Today, we'll see Scotland's Forbes Cowan in action. He'll be pitting his strength against one of the world's top bodybuilders, Curtis Leffler from the United States. Here now with more details about the competition is Paul Dickinson. These competitions are really testing our strong men to the limit, as we've seen in the last three heats. This week, the format exactly the same as before. Four men taking part in four different events and getting those four all-important points for a victory, three for second and so on. The two men who accumulate the greatest number of points at the end of the heat, they are the ones who go through to the final. Well, 12 months ago, it was Forbes Cowan who got to the final. That was considered to be something of a surprise. This time, he's even being talked about as a possible contender to take the overall title. First of all, of course, he has to qualify for that final, and that is going to be very tough. So now, let's meet Forbes Cowan and the rest, our competitors in heat four. Scotland have never had a World's Strongest Man champion, but Forbes Cowan has all the right credentials if he can negotiate this difficult heat. Bodybuilding is a sport which demands muscles in excess. That is why Curtis Leffler is one of the biggest and best in the whole world. Fleming Rasmussen is easily the heaviest man in this heat at over 150 kilos. Denmark's Strongest Man is making his debut in the competition. And finally, another debutante who's by far the tallest. 
Marco Varalati from Finland is being hailed by his countrymen as the new superstar of strength. In last week's heat, we saw the competitors carrying car engines. Today, they'll begin by pulling six cars, complete with their engines and with 20 passengers. Now, the secret here is to get off to a smooth start and keep up the momentum. Otherwise, you'll get into trouble. Over the 30-meter course, there's lots of potential for problems, and even the most experienced competitors are nervous. One or two people have actually said to me since I've been here that Forbes Cowan can win the World's Strongest Man this year. Do you think you can? Well, there's a lot of, a lot of folk competing, a lot of new people, a lot of new events, a lot of people stealing points. So basically it's anybody's competition. I don't think anybody could win it. But yeah. bodybuilding is your sport. And you're bodybuilding very is sport, successful but I think, at it. you know what, I think bodybuilding has a, an advantage here because it's not really a powerlifting thing. I think it's an endurance sport as much as powerlifting. So. And that's what a bodybuilder is. And despite the fact you've just stepped off a plane, you feel fit? I feel fit enough to give him a show. <laughs> we'll see whether Curtis can produce the goods later, but this is a very determined-looking Fleming Rasmussen who has the unenviable task of getting this heat underway. This always the moment which sets the pulse racing and which gives the other competitors any clues as to how to squeeze a little extra out of the event. Ready! Take the straight! Well, you heard Juliet say that a smooth start was one of the secrets of this event, and that is exactly what Fleming has managed to achieve. Rasmussen trying to keep the rhythm going, pulling with the arms and really pumping those legs. That good start he got is really paying dividends now. He's going so well, but I bet he's beginning to hurt now. The clock is ticking away, and it won't stop until the front of the first car is over the line, so he's got to keep working. Just a tiny bit further now. Come on, Fleming, keep going. 37.64, and his debut has been a good one. Fleming, a good start. You look very nervous at the beginning. Yeah. It's a big event for me. I, I was very nervous. What's the technique of pulling those cars? Just to stay down and uh, find a good rhythm. But it was very heavy at last. I'm satisfied. Curtis Leffler will have watched and listened to that and hopefully learned. This is the first time he's ever attempted anything like this before. And I'm not sure the crowd have ever seen anything like this man's muscles before either. He's just returned from one of the top bodybuilding contests in the United States, so he's in tip-top condition with his muscles looking fit enough to burst because of the incredible training regime and the diet he's just been through. Well, certainly no lack of effort from Curtis, but remember, this is just 19 stones pulling these cars, as opposed to Fleming's 24. That is going to make a difference. Fleming's time to beat in the top left-hand corner of the screen. This is where it's going to get very tough. He's only just arrived in Nassau a few hours ago. It's looking incredibly painful. He goes past Rasmussen's time, and he's finished just short of the line, so the car will have to be measured. The crowd looking stunned. His recovery from this event is going to take quite some time. Leffler, though, he put on a good show. I know with bodybuilding training, it's quite good for building up stamina as well, but have you ever experienced anything like that before? Uh, no, I can't say I uh, it's tough. This is Finland's first showing in World's Strongest Man 95 now, and Marco Varalati soaking up the atmosphere already. There's a big contrast to Curtis Leffler's physique. Now then, is he going to do it? Ready! Look at this, he's certainly blasting his way over the first part of the course, taking very short, sharp strides. He's absolutely eating up the ground. Finland have always produced some fantastic strong men, and Varalati already looking as though he's carrying on that tradition. The time is going to be very fast. He's only slowing just a little bit, but he's going over the last five metres well. This is the hardest part of the course. It's going to be the fastest so far, 30.84 seconds. What a fantastic effort. 
There was only a little stumble near the start, but otherwise this was tremendous technique. And with only Forbes Cowan to go, the Finn has already got some good points on the board. Well, etukäteen kun ajattelin tätä lajia, niin tiesin, että on hyvät mahdollisuudet tässä lajissa. Ja hyvät tuntuu. So it's just the Scott left now, looking quite quiet and pacing around at the start. A few worried faces in the crowd. That's Forbes' girlfriend Maria, hoping that he can challenge that fantastic time by Varalati. Well, like the flying Finn, he's staying very low and he's got off to a good start. He's so much more experienced this year, and Marco knows this is a good man. Well, I think you could see there, Forbes is actually wearing climbing boots to try and get a little more grip on this gritty surface. He was a surprise finalist last year, but the British contingent here say it's going to be no surprise if he makes it through this time. He's still driving those legs. He's got to get the car over the line. It's just outside, but it's good enough for a gutsy second place in this first event. He looks absolutely shattered. The heat and humidity still a problem for these big men. A valiant effort by Forbes Cowan, but not enough to beat Finland's Marco Varilati, who leads the pack in his first World's Strongest Man contest. For the next challenge, we've moved into the centre of Nassau. It's an event which has featured before in strongman competitions. It's called Samson's Barrow. Nine nervous-looking passengers there just taking their seats to make sure that Samson's Barrow is perfectly balanced. Fleming Rasmussen, the first to go, getting plenty of that French chalk on the hands. It's going to be all about grip, leg and back strength. <laughs> One of our girls there nearly jumped out of her skin when Fleming gave out that growl. There really are a few nervous passengers on that wheelbarrow. We've actually seen a few near crashes in this event in the past. Now, come on, Fleming, you can keep going. He's not supposed to slide it, though. He must lift it up and carry on, but the wheelbarrow is down again. He's actually sliding it over the line, 17.64 seconds, but with a technique I'm not sure the judges are going to be too happy with. Well, Fleming looks very pleased, but he may risk disqualification because of this sliding technique over the line. We'll have to wait and see what happens. Well, Forbes Cowan just asking referee Edmonds for clarification on the start. He must pick up the barrow and wait for the signal to go. Incidentally, Rasmussen was not disqualified, so his time stands. The grip height there, adjustable, depending on how tall the competitors are. Forbes in the past has always been very impressive in these lifting and carrying contests and appears to be going well here. He's really storming down the course, picking up speed all the time. It's so fast. 11.1 seconds. And Cowan's short burst of energy is surely going to bring him some good points in this event. Just watch this. Fantastic by Forbes Cowan. Slightly downhill, so the problem is keeping up with the barrel. It's going front. So you've got to keep up with it. Oh, you'll drop it. I've never seen you run so fast. No. I've got to it's a qualifying heat, it's a little strong as mine. I've got to run fast. There's Jamie Reeves, former British and world's strongest man, just making a few slight adjustments for our third competitor in Samson's Barrow. The leader after the carpool, Marco Varilati of Finland. Very tall, and as we've seen already, a man who can move very heavy weights at speed. He's accelerating well, but he's got a slight balance problem on that left-hand side. It's going to challenge Forbes time just outside, 11.48 seconds. And the Scot will breathe a big sigh of relief when he hears the time. Marco veering away off course. That was the difference between the lead and second place at the moment. Well, Curtis Leffler, despite his muscular definition, the smallest of the four competitors here. He needs good points in this event. Oh, this is a very shaky start already. His right hand giving way. This will be a big disappointment to the man from Hawaii. The clock is still ticking away. He has to go again. There's no way he's going to score highly here. And the grip has given out again. Curtis goes away looking very upset about his performance here as we come to the halfway stage of this week's competition. Not a challenge that suited Curtis Leffler. Marco Varilati's again done well in coming second, but this event belongs to Forbes Cowan.
Well, congratulations, your first winner this year in Strongest Man. Carrying things has always been your strong point, hasn't it? Uh, carrying things comes quite natural to me. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so things like the Farmer's Walk, I mean, that's got to be a strong event as well. Farmer's Walk's a really good event for me. I'm expecting to, if I get to the finals, I'm expecting to place high in that event. As it's turning out, these qualifying heats are very tough to get through. The, the qualifying heats are really hard because they're as heavy as the competition itself. And I mean, everybody's trying so hard. Some people make mistakes, others are not. It's just, you've got to get everything perfect. There's only four events. So with two to go, it's all square at the top of the table between Scotland and Finland. Denmark are in close contention, but Hawaii has a lot of work to do. Well, after that fantastic performance by Forbes Cowan, we've headed down to the beach for a bit of a breather. The fourth event will take place below me, here on Paradise Island. The small stretch of land is a popular holiday destination, and it's linked to the Bahamian capital, Nassau, by a bridge. At the water's edge stands the Atlantis Resort, just one of a number of large hotel complexes here, which offer a multitude of things to do. The Bahamas contain more than 700 islands scattered across the Atlantic Ocean, though only around 20 are inhabited, so if it's peace and quiet you're after, it's not hard to find. Atlantis Beach is the location for Event 3, Murder Ball, a new event, so how do the strongmen feel about it? I don't know, I haven't tried this event before, but, but I feel confident. I can still get in the final and I hope to do well. Well, I've tied this event in Iceland, but it was with a different kind of ball. Um, I'm pretty confident, but I'm just have to wait and see. I'm not, not too sure. As you heard, the boy's not sure about this one at all. And the first to show us how the earth moves, Fleming Rasmussen, who's got a 25 kilo body weight advantage over Forbes Cowan. That giant globe, which is weighted down with about 100 gallons of water, has to be pushed out of the circle in your opponent's half, and it's the best of three rounds that takes you into the final. Ready? Off we go, and it's Rasmussen with the globe just over the advantage line. It's as simple as that. 1-0 to Denmark. Fleming Rasmussen, believe it or not, a former national 10-pin bowling champion of Denmark, I bet he threw the balls down the alley at an almighty speed. But now Forbes Cowan on the right, looking a little more serious. He must win this one, or it's straight into the playoff for third or fourth place. It's desperate for the Scot. Fleming walks this one out of the circle, and he's gone into the final. A suggestion there of a shoulder injury for Forbes. But this is how Denmark did it. And now Rasmussen will meet either Varalati or Leffler in the final. You think weight is important? Yeah, weight and long arms to control the ball. If you've got long arms, you can feel where the other, one, the other competitor is going. Marco is a very big man, though. Yeah, but I'm, I'm 30 pounds heavier. I'm going to kick him out of the ring. Well, certainly there's no lack of confidence for Fleming. But as he mentioned earlier, long arms are very useful in this event, and nobody has them longer than Marco Varalati who goes up against Curtis Leffler. I must say, Varalati is looking more and more impressive, and Leffler is on his way out. Varalati's coach, Marku, there says, well done. Well, if there's going to be a repeat of that speed and aggression, Varalati is going to stroll into the final. Leffler finding the sort of rough and tumble here very difficult, and here he goes again. 2-0 to Marco. There's Ilkan Nemistu, a former Finnish strongman. He gives the thumbs up to his protege, who is getting more and more confident. Curtis Leffler back out in the arena against Forbes Cowan for the fight for third and fourth place. And already Cowan is one up on the Hawaiian. This tranquil beach, the ideal spot for relaxing. But Curtis, with two last places so far, needs something special here. And Forbes Cowan can't afford to relax too much with Rasmussen breathing down his neck. Curtis is looking better here. Forbes just leaning on the globe. It's even Steven so far. Leffler, the muscle man. Cowan, the hard man and the grafter. Now, can Leffler get this giant ball on the move towards the edge of the circle? It looks as though he can. This is going to be his first success. 
and both men look absolutely shattered. The crowd now waiting for the decider. And referee Doug Edmonds waiting patiently to preside over this final push to see who will take third place. There was a gruelling contest last year in the pole push when Forbes looked totally wrecked afterwards. And this is turning out to be the same sort of situation. Well, Forbes taking the early initiative. It looks as though this one could finish quickly. A win for Forbes Cowan and a precious two points which the Finn knows will be important to the final result. I don't think Curtis Leffler will forget his experiences here in a hurry. He gets another single point. Forbes, did you want to get that over and done with as quickly as possible? I had to get that one finished quick because there's just nothing left. I don't seem to be recovering. Whether it's because I put on too much weight or because of the heat, but I'm really finding it hard. This is a very important bout for Fleming Rasmussen because if he can win, he closes the gap on Forbes to within one point, which means a nail-biting finish to this fourth heat. Baralati is guaranteed three points minimum, so the Finn looking a safe bet for the final, but Fleming certainly a new find as far as strength contests are concerned. And Marco continuing where Riku Kirie left off last year, but look at this, it's Fleming with a rush who wins. It looks as though Rasmussen's greater aggression and body weight put pay to Varelati's will to win here. It was Rasmussen who said he was going to kick his opponent out of the circle. He's done it once, can he do it again? Both men are very agile and quick on their feet for such big guys. There's over 270 kilos of muscle on display here in a contest which is burning up the calories very quickly. They're training very much based on short bursts most of the time, so any prolonged effort hits them really hard. It's Fleming who wins this one for his first ever win in Strongest Man, and boy did he work hard for it. A head-to-head -head contest which he delights in winning. Well, Curtis Leffler's struggling and only third place for Forbes Cowan, who must be disappointed. Fleming Rasmussen needed points, and this time around, he's got them. Fleming, you needed to win that event to have a realistic chance of getting through to the final tomorrow, and you did it. Yes, uh, a, se a second place could be all right, but then I have to be real good tomorrow. So. I th this this was my event. I feel very good about it. I think I had control all the time of the, of the globe. So. so Fleming quite literally on a roll to close the gap on Forbes with Marco a further point ahead of last year's finalist. Who will qualify for the final is now anybody's guess. This next event is one of the more traditional strongman challenges. It's called the Atlas Stones. Basically, the competitors have to pick up those boulders and place them on the barrels here. The lightest weighs 95 kilograms, the heaviest 135, which is just under 21 stone. It's not, though, just a test of strength. The main thing is endurance. Atlas Stones is an event that you like, isn't it? I like Atlas Stones, um, it's usually a good event for me. I've never loaded them before. They usually sit next to the barrels, but it should be okay. What are the difficulties that you foresee with something like this? I think the difficulties will be in the sand, like walking and trying to run in the sand with them, maybe going over in an ankle or sinking in. Apart from that, it should be safe enough. How are you feeling at this stage, Forbes? Um, it's very close between you and Fleming. Um, are you nervous? Do you get nervous? Oh, there's always small touch of nerves there, but you just try to put them behind you and just keep your head together. How about this competition? Um, uh, is it one that suits you, do you think? I would have thought they all suited me, but <laughs> as I get to do them, they're not suiting me so much. But The Atlas Stones, how about that one? Yeah, uh, you know what? Next year they'll all suit me, but this year it's just an experience. Experience is something Forbes has in abundance. Thanks to the many Highland Games and strength contests, fellow Scott and former shot putter Douglas Edmonds has promoted in recent years. So this definitely should be a good one for Cowan. Curtis Leffler has discovered a different world outside his sport, and next year he certainly should be stronger and wiser. We could have a second British competitor in the final alongside Gary Taylor, but it all depends on Cowan beating Rasmussen. 
However, if Rasmussen beats Cowan, they draw level on points. But so far, this time, it's all about Forbes Cowan and Scotland. Hawaii finding it difficult. This is number three. On it goes. Now, come on, Forbes. This is where it counts. Leffler still down at number two, stranded. Now to the last one for Forbes Cowan. This could be worth a place in the final. He's given it 100% effort. He's got it. It's a very fast time. Maria is delighted. Curtis Leffler struggling with the second stun still. Perhaps a slightly demoralizing moment for him. But he now knows what it's like to be part of the biggest strength show on earth. I have to win to be sure to get in the final. If I get second, it depends of, of Varalazzi and, and Forbes, how they are doing. So I, I, must, I must go for the win. Kyllä mä uskon pääseväni, että vaikka mä olisin kolmas tässä, niin siinä vaiheessa kolmella kilpailijalla olisi samat pisteet. Ja jos se menee niin kuin aikaisemminkin, että aikaisemmat voitot ratkaisee, niin silloin finaalipaikka on varma. I couldn't have put it better myself. These two men know exactly what they have to do. Baralati and Rasmussen making their first ever appearance in World's Strongest Man and both making a big impression. And both men very tall and rangy, so well suited to this event. Baralati, in fact, on this side, well over two meters tall with a fantastic reach. Just wraps his arm around those stone balls. The first one looked very easy. Rasmussen keeping in touch, though. The crucial target in the left-hand side of the screen there, 44.76. That's Forbes Cowan's time. Well, Finland making it look quite easy at the moment, just creeping ahead of Rasmussen. This is turning out to be a very fast time, and this is bad news for Forbes Cowan. Look at that. Coming up to the last, and it was just Varalati by the skin of his teeth in a magnificent time, and Rasmussen ahead of Cowan as well. It's all down to the judges now to sort out who goes through to the final. It was so, so close, and Marco wins by a margin that is wafer thin. So Marco Varalati's four points mean he's through to the final, but the other scores leave a question mark over who'll join him. First of all, congratulations. Was it as easy as it looked? Kiitos. Ei se niin helppo ollut, että kyllä se kaikilla on yhtä vaikeaa. Mutta tänään meni hyvin toilla ja uskon, että finaalis pystyy vielä vähän parantamaan sitä. If he can, that's bad news for the rest, because he's shown what a tremendous athlete he is. But what about Forbes and Fleming? Level on points and previous places, how on earth will the judges resolve who goes through to the final? I bet you wish they, they're not going to give you another event to do <laughs> as a tiebreaker. They can't. They can't. They have to put uh, both of us in the final. That will be. If they give us an, another event, then we have an event more than all the other competitors. Well, exactly what happens next is up to referee Doug Edmonds, who decides on a playoff. The tiebreaker will be a race with one of the McGlashan stones over a measured course. 25, 30 meters, depends how we can put it in here. So the stone will be placed in front of you, blow the whistle, pick it and run for the line. The crowd having a certain amount of sympathy for these two guys. Go for it. And there's Maria giving Forbes some encouragement. The reason they couldn't be split was because they were absolutely level on previous first, second and third places. And that's the target for a place in the final, the quickest time to complete the course. Oh, it's Fleming away quickest. Forbes trying to hoist it onto his shoulder. He's catching up Rasmussen now, but he's dropped it. He's walked away. Rasmussen now knows he's won it. Rasmussen is delirious, and he goes and says thanks to the coach, who incidentally is bigger than he is. And Forbes must be hurting inside. The Great Dane celebrations are going to go on and on. And first of all, though, a big hug from girlfriend Connie. There's no doubt that Fleming was being caught, but Forbes just lost the delicate balance. He could have picked it up and gone on. I just wonder if he misunderstood the rules. Fleming knows he's in the final. 
and Forbes reflecting on what might have been. Congratulations, you're through to the final. You must be delighted. Yeah. I'm very delighted. I didn't, I didn't count to, to beat Forbes. It's, I didn't think I could do it. Well, the four events that you've done, they started off very slowly, but uh, like a good horse in a horse race, you've come through and yeah. come through well. First couple of days, <laughs> difficult breathing because of the heat. Oh, relax today, I feel fine. So, a huge disappointment for Scotsman Forbes Cowan, who was literally pipped at the post. The result means that the Dane, Fleming Rasmussen, and the Finn, Marco Verilati, join six other strong men who've already qualified for the final. Next week is the last heat, and all the men in it are new to the competition. They include a six foot ten Australian, known as Mega Man, and a champion arm wrestler, Magnus Samuelsson from Sweden. For now, though, it's goodbye. Coming next on BBC One, a chair that costs £15,000 and plays 3D videos in tomorrow's world.